Welcome to the Sage Women podcast, hosted by Melanie White and Dr. Nick Engerer. We have real conversations with real women, health professionals, and coaches who share stories about perimenopause, menopause, and a range of women's health issues. Please subscribe so you get the latest updates every fortnight. Hey, it's Melanie White here on the Sage Women podcast, and I am really pleased to introduce Yuna Angevin Castro here today. She's a women's health coach, and she has a special interest in both menopause and sleep. Yuna, thanks for being here today. Thanks for having me, Mel. Firstly, I love that we have matching jumpers. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> you can't plan these things, can you? Not at all. I guess it's one of those, it's a green day today. Yeah. You know, how did you sleep last night? I actually slept really well last night. Um, it's very cold here in Melbourne at the moment. And I think that having that cool temperature makes it a lot easier to, to get a good night's rest. But I should be asking you, how was your sleep last night, Mel? It was not bad, thanks. But I was going to ask you about your secrets because I know that there are a lot of women and especially those in menopause who aren't sleeping well. And it seems to be the number one challenge that women are facing. And then the subsequent exhaustion, grumpiness, all of the other things that, that happen after you don't sleep well, craving sugar, the list goes on. So tell us about sleep, you know, like what is it that we need to be doing to be sleeping well? Well, you're absolutely right, Mel. I think the stats are around between 40 to 60% of women in perimenopause and menopause complain about sleep, uh, that being their number one um, concern, I guess. Mm. Um, and I think it's often a precursor to what's about to happen in menopause. So women will often complain about sleep before perhaps some of the other symptoms rock along. Um, mm. And like you said, it's incredibly debilitating or can be poor night's sleep. I mean, it has so many flow-on effects. You make poor choices with your food, um, makes it really hard to concentrate the next day. So productivity at work might be down. Um, people are feeling probably not their best. So self-esteem and confidence can go down as well. Um, whole range of flow-on effects. And so, you know, we're very lucky in the sense that we are, live in an age now where we understand that sleep is such an important thing and a, a really um, important pillar of good health. Um, mm. And so people are paying a lot more attention to, to sleep and, and, and do, trying to do the right things to get better sleep. Um, so, yeah, and I, I feel very privileged to be working with women in that space. So, um, mm. so. Yeah, in terms of special tips, I don't know if I have any special tips. To, I guess the one thing I want people to understand is that sleep is such a personal um, thing as well. It's like nutrition and exercise and all of the things that we know we should be doing and trying to, um, you know, maintain good habits when it comes to sleep. But it's also a very individual journey um, as to what that looks like, um, you know, a lot of us think that we need to get eight hours sleep religiously and and that's not always a reality for women or men for that matter. Um, yeah. So it's about looking at where you're at, looking how you're feeling and, and perhaps looking at some of the things that you can do to not necessarily obtain perfect sleep but perhaps improving things if you're not feeling like you're waking up um, refreshed or satisfied in the morning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I suppose there's a lot of things we can look at. And as you say, it's highly individual. And I will point out at this stage of our conversation that we're not talking about menopause hormone therapy today, although that is one of the recognised treatments for women in menopause uh, going through these challenges and wanting to address symptoms. And that can be really helpful. But we're talking generally, I suppose, aren't we, about all of the things that impact sleep. And I feel a bit ripped off because when I was a teenager, I was one of those kids that would go on a school camp and at eight o'clock at night, I'd be going, mm -hmm, I want to go to sleep, shut up everyone. And everyone's running a mark in the dorm and I just want to get my sleep. So I dragged my bed over to the corner of the room. I remember doing once and trying to huddle away so I could get my 11 hours or whatever it was, because I loved having these long sleeps. And now I think, oh, I love, I love sleeping and not having an alarm in the morning. And yet, quarter to five or 5.15 every morning, even in the darkest of winter nights, my eyes pop open and I go, oh, 
just another hour you know it's it's tough as you get older and you need less sleep to try and get and to adjust and I, I think we talked about this earlier the mindset of how much do you need and the anticipation of what you're going to get it's it's a big part of that right it is it is um and it can be very difficult if if you are one of these people who does need 10 hours sleep and you can't get that you know and that might be for a raft of different reasons that might be because you have responsibilities parenting responsibilities you might have work responsibilities you might have um a lots of different things that might get in the way of you achieving that and you made a really good point around um you know this idea that you know waking up without your alarm but you weren't feeling refreshed you felt like you needed a little bit more and I think that's one of the key indicators that you know rather than fixating on a specific number of hours that you may or may not need but focusing more on okay well how am I feeling when I'm waking up in the morning and what can I do about that um so you know I, I challenge women to perhaps look at their day as a whole rather than just looking at those nighttime hours um mm. and, and look at what's happening in their lives beyond the actual bed and the bed night bedtime routines and the things that they're doing and look at you know your good sleep starts when you wake up basically um yeah. and and you know looking at all of the moving parts in their lives and things understanding what they can control and the things that they can't control um and I think that can be a good starting point to try and obtain a little bit more more um not control but but feeling a bit better about where you're at with your sleep um mm. I think we need to understand also that you know we're talking about women in menopause but ch changes in sleep actually occur as a consequence of aging not just the menopausal transition yeah um and, and as we age you know sleep architecture changes we we have more fragmented sleep we have um, shorter periods of slow wave sleep, you know, that really deep restorative sleep. So a lot of things change with age. So in men and women and men. So um, it helps sometimes to understand that, um, that it's not just about the menopausal change, that yes, hormones can be playing a part in it, um, but naturally our, our sleep changes as we get older anyway. It's such a great point because I think about when I woke up in the morning and my husband gets up early to let the chickens out of their coop and the ducks <laughs> that we have in the backyard. And that's normally around five o'clock or something. And then he comes back and he just falls into a really deep sleep. And we've had this conversation about waking up more frequently after about 2 a.m., but always managing to go back to sleep and many times feeling quite refreshed, even though we're having less sleep in total and some of those breaks it's 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 hard to get your mind around that when your expectation is I must sleep solidly without waking for eight hours well here's you start to realize that you can manage in a different way you know well here's an interesting statistic is that in every given hour that we sleep we actually have between 15 and 30 arousals during that time every hour which is quite an amazing um, figure we're actually dipping in and out of deep sleep and into shallower phases of sleep and we don't even realize it a lot of the time it's those moments where we actually those arousals are more abrupt and that we actually wake up and we 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 acknowledge that and we're aware of that but our sleep is constantly it's, it's a dynamic process right it's not a it's not a let's you know switch the lights off and and stay asleep until um yeah that eight hour period, which I find quite fascinating. Um, and I think understanding sometimes the physiology of, of sleep and how it plays out throughout the night um, can be really powerful in understanding that nighttime awakenings are actually a really normal part of, of a normal sleep cycle. When I say normal, I say that with, you know. What is normal? <laughs> no such thing as really normal, but yeah. um, it, it is natural to, to, to awake through the night. Um, and I guess it's when those awakenings feel troublesome and make people feel like, oh, gosh, you know, I'm not getting enough sleep that we kind of interrogate that a little bit more. Um, mm -hmm. Interestingly, there's, there's theories that, you know, historically back in the 
caveman days that we actually used to have what biphasic sleep, that it was actually normal for us to have two sleep sessions and be awake for a certain mm-hmm. period of the night. And the argument there is that, you know, in caveman days, you had one person staying awake to make sure yeah. the same tiger didn't come and attack your family. Um, and it's with the onset of the industrial revolution and lighting and all of these things that we've switched to this one block of sleep throughout the night. So um, you know, it, it's some researchers argue that it's perfectly natural and normal for us to have two stages of sleep and to wake up for periods in the middle of the night. So I'm not saying that that's necessarily what we want, yeah. uh, but it's not abnormal. And there are some cultures in the world where that is still perfectly the, the norm. You know, they wake up for periods of the, in the night and then go back to sleep. So um, it, it's very fascinating. I do find that. Um, at, but I think also understanding that and mm. and perhaps making peace with that to a certain degree can be quite powerful um and I guess allows a bit of exploration around what's going on and what other things might be happening in your life that could be causing you to wake up and not being able to go back to sleep um I mean I don't know about you but when I have had times where I've woken up in the middle of the night you know at 2 a.m and and it can be you know a case it's become a there's a disturbance or there's um it's become a habit I find that my inability to get back to sleep is often because my back, my brain switches on and I start thinking mm. about all, all of the things that I have to do the next yeah. and the negative thoughts around that and, oh, my gosh, if I don't get back to sleep, I won't be able to finish this piece of work. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that in itself is it is a challenge and it, it's about breaking those negative thoughts and, 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 mm. um, and, and this is where, why um, cognitive behavioural therapy is so powerful as a treatment for insomnia and, and people with sleep issues is because it's about, you know, intervening and, and, and breaking those cycles of negative thinking around your sleep. It's such an interesting area. Um, a few years ago, I was working with a company and doing a, a study on sleep and stress and, and physiological arousal. And we were working with some mining contractors and for a few of them, they would have a terrible sleep on the night before they flew back to site because of the anxiety about sleeping through the alarm and not making the plane in the morning. And also, what are they walking into on that first day? And in and they were more senior roles, a full inbox of, of staff or a disaster that they need to clean up as soon as the shift starts. So they would have this... Uh, anticipatory response that started in the night before and they would have broken sleep and then they'd be, need to get up at three or four in the morning to, to get to an airport, to get to a, on a plane, to get to a site and then potentially work a 12-hour day in some cases. I think about the, the risks associated with working under that level of fatigue but also recognising that it's what's going on in their mind that's driving that because every other night they're sleeping well. It's just the night before flying that they're not. Yeah. And we've all had those experiences where, you know, you're worried about sleeping through the alarm and then you wake up before it anyway. <laughs> and then you go, darn, I could have had another 10 minutes <laughs> or whatever it is. Yeah. You raise a really good point though, Mel, around um, the, the impacts of poor sleep. Um, and, you know, in that case of, quite an extreme case, the safety consequences in the workplace of not getting enough sleep. And I think I think something that we really need to work harder at, I think, as a as a society, is is um I guess making conversations about sleep, normalizing those. And, and making it easier for people to talk about the issues they have with sleep in the workplace. And certainly for women in menopause, we talk, we, you know, there's a lot of conversation around, you know, making it easier for women to have um, easy and, and transparent conversations about what's happening. Well, I think mm. for sleep that applies to everybody. You know, being yeah. able to speak to a workplace, uh, your manager or someone about saying, I have really not slept well tonight. 
You know, can we be more flexible about the tasks that I'm doing? Because these are safety, um, occupational mm. health safety consequences that are quite profound. Um, and I think for a long time we've seen, you know, there's a lot of that bro culture where, you know, I, I'm, you know, so high performing, I get up at 4 a.m. and run for an hour and then I do all yeah. this that kind of stuff and we kind of glamorize this idea that having less sleep means we're more resilient and more you know we're better at what we do and I think it's really important that we kind of peel away those layers a little bit and talk more openly about you know what does poor sleep look like for people and how does it actually impact them in the workplace and what can we do to better support uh, women and men um, to to perform their best when they haven't necessarily had a good night's sleep, um, and being a bit more understanding. Maybe for some people that might be, you know, calling your manager and saying, I've slept really poorly, can I come in an hour or two later today um, just so that you can kind of catch up or acknowledging that there is a safety risk for someone, like you said, in a, on a mining site, you know, operating heavy machinery when they've had a poor night's sleep rather than assuming that people should just push through um, mm. that. that There's no badge of honour for not sleeping well. So I don't believe so. And there's an actually really interesting um, research that's come out of the US around, um, particularly for midlife women, around the impact of poor sleep and that um, there's a 31% um, have this is the US SWAN study, they found that 31% of women in midlife were actually more, sorry, became unemployed and and a lot of that was associated with the sleep disturbances. So they felt so unable to continue working productively in their workplace, yeah. unsupported, they felt that the, the better option was to actually leave their jobs. And I know that, you know, SAGE is doing a lot of work in that space and trying to, to make those conversations easier to have. But, it's, I mean, that's a start. That's one in three women, you know, who, who are no longer working um, because it's something that they don't, they can't necessarily control or they don't have the tools to manage. So. Mm. It's a good point, isn't it? And I think about um, women that have babies and I can think of a conversation I had with someone last year who was going through that sleeplessness phase with her child and disrupted sleep patterns and just the raw emotion around that it, it when it goes on and on and on it's just so incredibly emotionally draining I mean imagine being in a customer service role and feeling like that yeah you know there's no wonder people have to leave work it, yeah. it totally makes sense and so then what do we do well while we're awake at 3 a.m. scrolling through social media or whatever else we're doing against all advice about switching off the blue light. But we're looking for solutions. We're going, what do I do? And what are some evidence-based things that people could do, you know, to help them or to experiment with, to help them with their sleep? Yeah. Look, before I get onto that, you made a really good point around, you know, talking about women with young children. And we accept as a society that women with young children will have fragmented sleep. And we're very sympathetic towards women with young children because it's considered to be, you know, it's this external factor. You're caring for another human. You know, you're going to be, you have sleepless nights and people are quite understanding of that. Um, the reality is, is that throughout the entire lifespan, we have um, different things that can similarly interrupt our, our sleep. So, you know, we might have a partner who snores as a, a you know, it's mm -hmm. not what I can do about that. Um, yes, I might have a spare bed and if I do, I would perhaps move into that spare bedroom, but not everyone has that luxury, right? Mm -hmm. um, I also know like as a parent of a, 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 a older teenager who are going out to parties and things, we have the same, you know, anxieties. You go to bed, but unless your daughters walk through the door or your sons walk through the door and you know that they're safe and sound, that can be very disruptive to sleep as well. Yeah. You're lying there with your radar on listening for the front door to open and what time is it? Are they home yet? That's exactly right. So I think, you know, we should be offering the same level of understanding 
um, at all life stages that sleep can be impacted yeah. by a, a range of things and it's you know it's not just a nursing mother or um, a parent of young children that's going to have disrupted sleep that that can continue for many 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 yeah. years beyond and so I think you know we need to be um, a lot more offer a lot more empathy to the people we work with um, around you know how sleep can can show up or not show up for people in different life circumstances so Mm -hmm. especially with things like anxiety which is on the rise in women and obviously anxious thoughts are the things that can keep you awake at night and that reciprocal link with depression and sleep and and the high uh, correlation I think I think it's um 70% 70% of mental health concerns yeah. are linked with sleep. Poor the sleep. bi-directional nature of sleep is, is you know, it it's one, makes it one of the most fascinating things when you're talking about health. It's also one of the things that makes it the mo- most difficult to study. Yeah, because <laughs> it's, yeah, there's not one, there's not a silver bullet. No, there isn't. And, and you're absolutely right when it comes to mental health. Um, you know, there's there's a, a strong correlation between sleep and depression and sleep and suicidality, um, and, and it's a very, you know, they're very intertwined. What we do know is that if you actually address the sleep in those circumstances, usually the depression or the anxiety improves. So um, it's complex because you can't, you know, you can't give someone who's having suicidal thoughts uh, an antidepressant because that comes with risks. So how do we address sleep in a way which is keeping the person safe but also achieving the outcomes that, that we need? Um, and, and when we talk about evidence base, I mean, the, the strongest evidence is for cognitive behavioural therapy. Um, okay. It's the strongest um, strongest evidence base for being successful in helping people with um sleeping issues the challenge is is that it takes time and people are often looking for an immediate um Mm. response um so you know you might have a cognitive cbt program that might go for six eight twelve weeks um and getting people to kind of i don't like the word compliance but people you know commit committing to it for that period of time can can be challenging so you know beauty of being a health coach is that what that's what we're there for to to help support yeah. people through that and help them work through the 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 hurdles that might be um mm. preventing them from from following that um but certainly that that is the gold standard in terms of um, dealing with with sleeping issues is mm. cbti um and that can be with a obviously a, a therapist but there are actually self-guided cbt um programs available you know apps and the like that have also shown to be quite effective so Mm -hmm. um, people can can explore um cbt in their own space in their own time as well and and that's been shown to have a positive impact on okay so um in terms of other evidence-based um strategies certainly for midlife women there's a strong focus on stress reduction so the, the link between stress and hormones and and sleep is is quite you know acknowledged and quite intermeshed. Um, so we find that um, you know participating in perhaps exercise programs like yoga or tai chi or things that are relaxing um, before bedtime or throughout the day can be really effective and also helping to improve improve sleep um in in midlife women um and look you know there are also some nutritional strategies that people might like to explore you know i don't know if you've you know heard of the sleepy girl mocktail which um claims to help people sleep through the night you know this idea that you can make a mocktail out of tart cherry juice and some people claim it works wonders and others for others it doesn't work and I think mm. that my um, philosophy in terms of those kinds of um, nutritional interventions is more around give it a go and see if it mm. works and if it does yeah. great if it doesn't and you know it, it, 
doesn't doesn't mean that it it's ineffective overall, but it's just not working for you. Um, and I think it's that personalised um, strategy that, that that we need to explore. It's not one size fits all when it comes to sleep. I I hear you, and I've been experimenting with it for a few years, and I've finally figured out the nights that I'm not sleeping well, what's happening then, and what the nights that I am sleeping well, what's happening then, and I've kind of tracked it and realised, just as you're saying, stress is a huge part of that. And I know that if I if I notice myself feeling wound up, it doesn't necessarily correlate with a number of meetings or a number of hours worked or anything, because I can work a long day occasionally and still sleep well, mm-hmm. which, you know, oh, it's frustrating, but then you learn from that. I've noticed that there's a feeling I get that, that tension in my chest, the racing pulse, and if that's happening during the day, early afternoon, I need to finish early. I need to go and do something else and step away from work or I won't sleep well. And I think the other thing for me is definitely around food. If I eat too close to bedtime, if I eat too much, if I have too much protein or too much fat, or if I have too much alcohol or sugar, any of those things or a combination of those things can just upset my tummy and I'm waking up burping at two o'clock in the morning. Mm. I've become much more sensitive to those things post-menopause. So I've just realized that my life has to change if I want to sleep well yeah. in, the, in those two areas. But, but you know, knowing what those signs are, everyone can measure or feel a sense of tension in their body in the day and in their mind. And that's the sign to pull back, right? And everyone can feel when they've eaten too much or when they've eaten the wrong food, it's a, it's a feeling that we can all tap into. It just takes that attention and the consistency around managing those things. Yeah, I think knowledge is power in these circumstances. And and when I work with women, the first thing I get them to do is to fill out a sleep diary, which is not really a sleep diary. It's more of a, you know, just a diary of what they're doing throughout the day. Mm. Um, and, and you've made the point around, you know, th- there are triggers like caffeine and and too much alcohol can certainly be triggers for for poor sleep. Um, And, you know, alcohol in particular, I think we talked about this previously, um, you know, if women are feeling stressed throughout the day and they're using alcohol as a way to unwind at the end of the day, that can be have compounding effects. So I think um, making um, actually actively recording what's happening for you throughout the day, how you're feeling, what, are some of the triggers is really powerful. You know, a lot of women haven't actually tracked what they're doing when they've got poor sleep and they haven't actually taken the time to look at well, what's happening. What time am I actually going to bed? Am I going straight to bed or am I staying in bed scrolling on my phone for an hour? So, you know, we have these ideas of what we think we're doing versus what we're actually doing. And, doing yeah. and um, you know, it's quite powerful to get them to write that down. And when they look at it, they go, oh, yeah, maybe I shouldn't be drinking those four coffees after lunch because they've had a slump in energy and they're just trying to get through the day. Um, and and being able to look at that and, and make some conscious, deliberate, intentional choices about what they're willing to, to do and what they're not willing to do. For some women, you know, giving up, their their nightly glass of wine is a step too far so okay where are you willing to land in 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 order to get the sleep that you need Mm -hmm. um for others it's like no brainer oh yeah ditch the wine that's fine I don't really care that much but you know I can't give up my coffee um so I think like I said knowledge is power understanding what the behaviors you're you're um, partaking in throughout the day and how they're contributing to to your, your night time and your sleep and your stress levels and all those things is really quite um, powerful and profound when, when you look into it a little bit more deeply. Mm. And that's where people often need help. I mean, even for myself, I know I am a coach and I know how it works, but the tracking, I kind of got tracking fatigue partly because... I wasn't working with someone, I was doing it on my own. And then I think I'd figured out what was going on and then I'd set up the perfect conditions and have a crap night's sleep. Mm. And then I'd go, oh. And you kind of lose motivation and confidence when that happens. I think it's so important 
to work with somebody to help you be consistent, to understand that not you may not land on the perfect solution. It might change or there might be a certain set of circumstances that you can't actually see that maybe someone else needs to yeah to pick up on it it's it's a bit of a, a quandary and getting support when you're feeling tired is so important it is it is look you, you made a really good point there it's, it, it's about building confidence around sleep mm-hmm. um and, and the other thing I like to talk to women about is you know sleep is the the rock star of of recovery you know it it is the the thing that we aspire to the most but we shouldn't underestimate the value of rest and recovery okay Uh, so you know yes we all we are all aiming for that eight hours of sleep or whatever number that we've put is is our, our sweet spot um but unless you have the scaffolding in place in your life to achieve that it, you may never actually get there. So, you know, if you're running at 100 kilometres an hour all day, every day, drinking coffee, finishing up the day with wine, you know, never stopping to, to rest and recover, mm. you can do all of the things <laughs> and you're not going to achieve that. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I challenge women to slow down a little bit and just, and, and that's where that tracking process is, is quite valuable in that you know you might spend two weeks tracking and I'm not I'm not a proponent for tracking endlessly you know yeah things it's more of an extra and and look I I have mixed feelings about apps in that in in doing that I know people love to record stuff on apps and and the like I'm actually a bit old school I usually um send someone a, a you know a pdf tell them to print it out and actually physically write down what's going on as opposed to recording it on your phone or things like that or using tracking devices, you know. Mm. Just, you know, take the time, think about it, write it down and, you know, for a fixed period of time um, and look at what you're doing. And a lot of women will find that they're not actually spending any time resting. Like they're expecting to go from 100 to sleep in, in, you know, 30-minute window and doesn't work that way (laughs) you know just switch you might you might hit the pillow straight away and fall fall asleep straight away but you won't necessarily get that deep restorative sleep that you're you're craving and looking for so sometimes it's about going okay well where can I find periods of rest or periods where I can slow down um and I I kind of work with a, a a framework which which encourages women to find those opportunities you know can I go for a walk on my own without the kids constantly knocking on my door and can you do this can you do that like actually disconnecting and having some time to yourself to calm and relax and and slow down that might be a yoga class for some women that might be hiking on you know with friends for some women but learning to kind of read you, you talked about listening to your body you know recalibrating and, and getting some time to bring down the um, the level of stimulation. And I think the more of that that women are able to do, the more likely they're going to move towards better sleep as well. Mm, that's so interesting. And I think about the things that I was tracking and they weren't the things that you're talking about, which is really interesting. And perhaps if I had been looking at those things, it might have made a bit of a difference. I might have seen something else. So even now thinking, oh, yeah, well, I've tracked some things. I've obviously had this blind spot about tracking rest or understanding breaks during the day. Mm. And in my responses, I don't think I had been tracking those things either. So, yeah, yeah. interesting. So, uh, you know, with, like the sleep, sleep is, in, is so important, but there's a continuum, right? Um, yeah. and, and rest, rest, quiet. Peaceful rest is really important as well. Just having downtime um, is important as well. And I think we, I mean, we we work in a, we live in an era where everyone's moving at a fast pace and we're trying to get things done and we're trying to be efficient and productive and all of the things. Um, And sometimes we just need to stop, breathe, calm. And we just, sometimes we just need to listen to our bodies. If our body is screaming and, and then, you know, 
I like to think of sleep as a barometer to overall well-being. If your mm. sleep is, is not great, probably something else going on. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm. And like I said, it could be your stress levels are too high or there's other things going on. So, you know, listening to your body and thinking about it and slowing down I think is really valuable, particularly for Particularly for midlife women when there's so many demands, right? You've yeah. got parents, you've got children, you've got work, so many things happening simultaneously and, and a lot of women can can let themselves be the last, you know, they're, they're the last on the list of priorities and yeah. just challenging them to find a little bit of time. I mean, it might just be, you know, making a cup of tea and, and sitting out on the deck on your own without you're saying to your family, don't talk to me for half an hour. I, I need this time to myself, turning off the phone and just having some time to yourself. But that looks different for every woman, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying that that's, that's the right thing for everybody, but I think there is value in, in um, timetabling or planning for some rest time, which is not necessarily sleep. It might be. It might be a nap for some people. Mm. But um, to to just to recalibrate and you know, bring the the calm the nervous system and relax a little bit. As you're talking, I'm thinking about how much like weight loss this is. People go, just give me the diet, tell me what to eat, and I'll do it. But it doesn't work like that. It's it's a really needs to be a holistic approach. And I love what you've talked about this fact that everyone's unique. And it's almost like you have to find your own unique sleep formula. What are the elements that are driving sleep or lack of it? And what can you do over time to support bringing those things, those good things in more consistently? Yeah. Yeah. And acknowledging that there are things that are out of your control as well. That, yeah. you know, for some people, it you know, they might be living with pain. They might be living, you know, with circumstances that that prevent them from achieving that traditional model of an uninterrupted night's sleep, um, and and that can be a real sore point sometimes for people. It's like, well, you know, why can't I? But because sometimes our life circumstances don't allow that. You know, we have mm. we have those other responsibilities. So in failing that, <laughs> where can we where can we find some gains in terms of um, rest and recovery that might make it a little bit easier to to walk through that I mean that may change you know as your children grow up and move out then you're not necessarily lying in bed worrying about them as much Mm. um maybe not right yeah good well you can't just switch the worry off and go oh well I'll stop worrying about them now (laughs) it doesn't work like that does it right and the other thing I, I think is really important to stress is that you know there is a place for people to speak to their GPs around other, you know, there are things to be concerned about with sleep apnea, for example. You know, the rates of um, sleep apnea throughout most of the lifespan, mostly men, men have a higher rate of sleep apnea, but when women um, after men- postmenopausal women, actually that their, their risk increases substantially. Um, and sometimes people just don't realise that they are sleeping poorly because they they have sleep apnea. Um, mm. So if there's any concerns or if you've got a partner who's saying, you know, oh, you're snoring, you know, your snoring is out of hand or you're, you know, you're just constantly not feeling refreshed at all, go get it checked out. Don't, don't you know, don't rely on the tart cherry juice if you have real concerns because yeah. um, getting a referral for a sleep study could be life-saving in, in some of those circumstances. Mm. So don't. Mm. Don't ignore it. Get it checked out. Speak to your doctor um, if you need to. Um, but also understand that there are things that you can you, you can do. You don't have to resort to medications necessarily um, to sleep to deal with sleep issues. Um, but don't don't sleep on it. Right. Just <laughs> get it, it looked at. If you have any concerns about your sleep and it's a recurring chronic issue. Um, it's really important right and it's not something you should be mucking around with I think so you know thank you so much for your time today 
My pleasure, Mel. It's always a pleasure to come and chat with you. It's been super helpful, eye-opening for me, and I hope for people listening to this, they'll be thinking about what's going on for them in their life as a whole, not just in the hours before bed. And also, we'll put your details in the show notes for this episode because I'm sure there'll be people that might have questions or want to find out how to work with someone that can help them make sense of what's going on with their sleep. Definitely, definitely. Thanks so much, Mel. Thanks, Yuna. Have a great afternoon. You too.